Hi everyone. Um, welcome to the transport workshop. And today, uh, this is being hosted by Neil, um, myself, Yuchon, and Sohel. And let's get that started. So, okay, so this is our tentative agenda uh, today. Um, first, we'll talk about um, um, the transport work by at the Facebook. Um, you know the BPF uh, extensions. And then uh, we are going to move to uh, some POS improvement. And then we'll uh, briefly talk about, you know, the BBR2 uh, congestion control that we have been working on uh, here at Google. And I think um, Alexi uh, from Dropbox is going to talk about how they uh, evaluate the BBR2 um, on their um, edge network. And uh, in the last 25 minutes, uh, we'll talk about some kind of like open mic uh, topics, uh, things that we have been uh, sort of uh, uh, looking and might be interested to people. Um, um, here are the two sort of uh, items that we propose and uh, people are feel free to, you know, add to uh, this. Uh, you can send it uh, over the chat or you can speak up now uh, if you have some interesting things that you really want to gather opinions or share with um, this transport area folks. Then uh, we will move to the first uh, talk by uh, Martin Lu at Facebook. My name is Martin. Um, I work in the kernel team in Facebook. Um, so today I want to talk about the uh, BPF work we have done to make the uh, uh, Linux networking stack extensible. So uh, those are the common, we have some common requests to our team uh, to, to make uh, kernel changes and they are uh, um, for, for the transport uh, specific, uh, they are the uh, modifying the TCP congestion control or creating new TCP congestion control. And another one is the uh, uh, writing new options to the TCP header. So those are the two things that I will want to talk about uh, in, in today's discussion. So before we make it, uh, uh, extensible by BPF, how do we usually do that now? It's, um, it's not easy for most of the uh, developers and research researchers because um, they have to make kernel change carefully, carefully in the sense that don't crash the kernel and things like that. And also it will take quite a long time to turn around from deploy, gather data, and then we iterate and then try again because uh, that means uh, for making kernel changes, that means you need to upgrade the kernel or at least upgrade the kernel module for the TCP congestion control case. Uh, but for the head option case, pretty much we have to upgrade the kernel. And for some of our production environment, it has a very long tail of kernel versions, which make this whole process not super easy uh, for, for most of the developers. So what we want to do is to make use of BPF to make to, to make this whole uh, uh, process much easier and much safer to the production. Uh, by using BPF, uh, the BPF verifier provides a lot of safety guaranteeing. For example, it will ensure that uh, the BPF program itself won't crash the kernel or won't cause any memory corruption or deadlock and things like that. Uh, so that will provide more confidence to test in the production and, and uh, make the uh, developer life easier. And the second thing is um, the developer only need to compile the BPF program once and then it can be, the same BPF program can be run in uh, different kind of versions. Uh, so that will also make the deployment easier. So now let's dive in um, to the uh, TCP congestion control. Um, so in this slide, I have put two pieces of code here. One is uh, one is uh, the BPF cubic, and one is the uh, kernel cubic. Uh, from these two pieces of code, can you guys quickly tell which one is the kernel cubic, which one is the uh, BPF cubic? Sure. 
I think this uh, is easier to guess uh, because the wall pointer casting on the left is sort of uh, giving it away, um, um, which is a uh, some boilerplate uh, code that required for the uh, BPF congestion control to cast the function pointer. But uh, but other than that, is uh, it, it it is written pretty much the same uh, as you know uh, to implement a congestion control in Linux, um, we need to fill, implement a lot of function, a few function pointers in the struct TCP congestion ops. So that uh, the BPF Cuba is doing exactly the same thing, is filling out the exact same TCP congestion ops structure. Um, so if you don't believe me, it's written pretty much the same way. Uh, we can dive into one of the uh, Function pointer implementation. Uh, I picked the SS trash here because it's uh, small enough to be demonstrated in one slide. Uh, so in this slide is uh, the SS trash uh, implementation for Cubic. Uh, so one piece of code is uh, written in BPF, another piece of code is uh, written in the kernel uh, way, kernel CC way. Uh, from these two pieces of code, uh, I think it's, you won't be able to tell which one is which because they are, should be exactly the same, except the fir very first slide I, ha I have a couple of. Um, so the left one will be the one implemented in BPF. Um, the only difference is, again, the very first line um, um, that uh, put in the function selector. In, in the BPF, it require a Macro, uh, which is also some BPF boilerplate uh, code that require uh, the BPF program to do. Uh, but other than that, in the in the in the function uh, body, it should be line by line the same. As you can see, the BPF program can assess the TCP socket. Uh, it can even assess the uh, CA private space and even write to it and do exactly the same things that the kernel. CC module can do. So after we have a disruptor, after the BPF Cube has been written, how can we be used in the production? Um, so first, uh, it needs to be loaded by a command called BPF2. After loading it, the BPF Cube can be used exactly the same as other kernel CC module can be used. For example, it can be observed in the uh, syscuttle um, in the second command line. Um, we can see it as one of the available congestion control. And we can even use the BPF Cubic as the def default congestion control by, by uh, setting in the syscuttle also. And it, yes, it can be used in sessor op too. Um, so if we want to only use the BPF Cubic in some specific connection, or uh, it can be done too. Uh, so again, uh, once it, once the BPF Cubic is loaded, it could be used exactly the same way as other kernel congestion control model do. So what what's the status of this? Um, uh, it is available since kernel five point six. And I have also landed the Cubic and DC TCP example in the self-test directory. Um, so if you're interested, please take a look and see how, how um, it is written in the BPF. So next I want to talk about is the uh, uh, TCP head options. So the idea is to allow the BPF program to write TCP head option and pass the TCP head options. So the use cases uh, we have internally, we have in mind internally is, uh, for example, writing the maximum delay at in the header, and the receiver set a lower uh, retransmission timeout. And other things that we want to try is uh, putting a leg speed in the header, or or the congestion control one side is preferred, and etc. So the idea is um, we will allow the BPF program uh, to write any header option pound. 
the kernel doesn't put a lot of restriction on what header option can you can write. Um, the only things the kernel pretty much will track is to ensure uh, the option is not duplicated. For example, the BPAP program cannot write the window scale options because it has already been written by the kernel. So this feature I expect will be uh, mostly used uh, during the freeway handshake, but uh, that can also be used in the data packet header, pure ad header, or even a thin packet header. Um, so I've already posted this change to the uh, mailing list. Um, it's went for a few revision already. And I got some good feedback from Eric and, uh, and a few uh, other BPF maintainer. Hopefully it will be landed in the upcoming release cycle. So I'm hoping to be sometime later this month or early next month, hopefully we'll get landed. Um, so the last I want to talk about is the um, uh, socket storage for BPF program. Um, so as we know, we, uh, we try to make the more, more networking uh, feature extensible by BPF. We'll start waiting more BPF program to, to program the networking step. It is uh, getting more and more common that the BPF program want to store something uh, or associate some data to a specific socket. For example, uh, we may have a new TCP CC uh, algorithm that may want to store a few more data for a connection. For example, it could be a few more round trip time sample uh, to a connection. Uh, so the old way to do it is to um, create a BPF map uh, with, the, with the four tuples as the, as the key. Uh, the four tuple is the user, source, destination, IP, and port. And then you uh, store the data as the value of the map. Uh, it, it, it could be do this way and it, it works fine, but the downside is um, it's quite expensive. Uh, for example, the lookup time uh, is expensive and it also costs memory to store these four, uh, four tuples as the key. And more importantly, it's a nightmare to maintain. For example, um, we need to remove this key or remove this entry from the map when the socket is closed or the connection is closed. Otherwise the map will get exposed Exposed if we don't remove them from the map when the socket is closed. Um, so a new way to do it is to uh, the BPF program allow, right now we allow the BPF program to store something, to store extra data natively to the socket. Uh, and this data will go away with the socket. So if the socket get closed, this uh, data stored by the BPF program will also go away uh, automatically. Um, and it's pretty easy to use. Um, the BPF program only need to use a helper called BPF SK storage get, and then pass in the SK pointer as one of the argument. And then you can get access to the data you has stored in the socket. Um, that's pretty much what I have. Um, so um, what next, uh, I think is, uh, I want to hear from you guys, what do you want to be extensible, extensible by BPF2? Um, could be other transport or the IP header or routing or QDs. Uh, yeah. That's all I have. So do we just want questions over the mic or chat? Anyway, let me ask a question. Uh, so with the TCP option rewrite, have you considered um, how to deal with that in the presence of TCP authentication option? I'm not familiar with that option. Can you tell me more about that? So it's, uh, it's, it is, it's what it sounds like. It basically authenticates the TCP header. So the obvious thing is if, if that option is used, then <clears throat> no, one, no one below the stack can change any of the TCP header 
And if they do, then um, verification fails at, at the peer endpoint. It's kind of a common problem we see. Um, we'll see that in certain cases with IPsec and um, other cases, uh, AH option um, would, also, would all have that impact if we were rewriting an IP, op, uh, IP extension header option, for instance. So if, if it's kind of tricky because if the host stack doesn't realize that somebody may change it underneath and the thing underneath doesn't realize that the host stack doesn't want things to change, uh, then we have a problem because um, packets may be dropped because of these um, changes in the middle of the network. And th this option would be particularly useful uh, for rewriting, I think you mentioned rewriting things like um, uh, sender window, which a lot of satellite links do in order to optimize them. But turn on any sort of authentication of the header and all of that just falls down. Um, but he, but he had, but that header is written. I, I, I'm not sure I understand because that is the same as any other new option getting written by the TCP stack, right? If if the lower stack want to authenticate, it has to deal with it as of today. How would that be any different? Well, if I understand it correctly, if if you're doing this in BPF. If it's being done as part of the stack, then that's not that's not much of an issue um, because because the stack is is basically asking for it, and it would set up the if it sets up the TCP authentication after the BPF is run, then that's fine. But the problem we have is when it's being done outside of the auspices of the stack, like a, a like I said, the network networking device at the ingress to a satellite link may try to write its own option data or uh, the receive window may try to rewrite those. And if, if authentication is present, the, the packets drop because the data being off, that's in the authentication, the comp computation for authentication fails. So anyway, so let, let's take it offline, but um, like when, whenever we do this sort of thing, it, it adds a lot of power, people are gonna use it, but there, there are potential downsides that particularly in security yeah right now right now this feature is implemented in the tcp stack so anything goes under any anything want to do authentication under this under the tcp layers should should take should work or take care of it otherwise for example i would imagine it's like it's like uh let's say a new new option get added to the standard we a new kernel rollout will also do the same thing at new, write this new standard option at the TCP layer also. But if I think you're talking about more a out of band header changes may may topple the uh, the authentication. Yeah, but yeah, that's a way to concern us. It's inevitable, um, yeah. and and it, it's something we're going to have to deal with. Uh, we, we're looking at this problem in uh, six man, so you may want to follow, follow that, but that's for destination and hop by hop options. Anyway, so I, I think it's uh, it's an issue, um, probably not a showstopper, but I just wanted to bring it up. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Judge Hong on the chat um, asked this question, uh, do you have any performance data comparing in kernel versus BPF congestion control? Yeah, I have. We did some tests. Um, I we we did some. I hope I should have pu pulled that this graph. Um, yes, we did some tests. We don't see we don't see meaningful difference in, in terms of performance, throughput performance and CPU performance. We don't see meaningful difference. Okay, and there's another question on chat that are there any new verifier checks for BPF BCC that we should be aware of? What do you mean by verify check? You mean the, there's, there's some change to verify for sure, but uh, I'm not sure there's something that uh, you need to worry about. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm also not very clear what verifier checks. Um, yeah, because so, uh, for new feature add for 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 adding new feature like that, there will be some change in the verifier because it need to check a few more things right to ensure the program is is legit and not harming the kernel. But I don't think that's something that um, the BPF programmer need to be wary about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, by the way, thanks for this uh, work. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, this kernel TCP changes in BPA is really a, a big advancement, at least for um, people who work in you know, uh, large data center uh, companies uh, because um, this allows very fast deployment of uh, TCP changes or fixes. Um, my question is that how big of the TCP congestion control, is there a size limit? For example, uh, VBR is obviously more complicated than cubic. So is there a particular size limit that we should be aware of when people trying to port um, their condition control using your work? No, in terms of uh, in terms of number of uh, instruction BPF instruction, I don't think I don't think it is something that we have to worry about because right now I think the limit is a more than million instruction, so I don't think we will hit that. Any 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 TCP CC will hit that limit. Okay, sounds very promising. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, um, I think Srinivas uh, mentioned another question. Um, uh, the performance is similar to in kernel, but should we expect lower latency and CPU with BPF? Lower latency in terms of the response time latency or? I, in terms of response time latency, lower in BPF, no, we don't, we don't, we don't see that. The latency time from the test I have, I've done is also pretty much the same as the kernel, the kernel uh, implementation. Cool. Any other people have questions? Okay, um, then I have another. <laughs> so um, when we are loading this uh, BPF, let's say, right, in um, this is a live host, many people, uh, many connections are using the BPF CC, like the BPF cubic, right? Mm -hmm. Can, let's say, and then we decided to upgrade this BPF cubic. Can uh, the host literally like just plug in another new BPF cubic and the new flows will immediately hop onto this new uh, code. Like what's the transition in the scenario? So um, that's a great question. The transition will be just exactly the same as the native kernel module. So um, so can you load the, can we load the BP, a new BPF cubic? Um, yes, if you give it a different name, called BPF cubic version two, yes, then we can know it. Um, will it automatically switch the existing connection to use the BPF cubic V2? Uh, no, because uh, that is also the limitation of the, uh, of the kernel CC module, right? Because loading, loading a new kernel CC module doesn't automatically uh, switch the existing connection to use that too. But, um, but uh, we can, that's also a common problem that we have. Um, so uh, one solution we have start to come together is to, is, uh, is um, there is way in the BPF to iterate uh, all the connection now. So uh, it's called a BPF iterator. One of the iterator is to iterate all the TCP connection. So what we can do now is um, we can use this BPF iterator to iterate all this TCP connection and then 
track which one we need to switch to congestion control algorithm. And then we can switch that to BPF qubit V2. So that's one way to do it now. Uh, but of course, it's not as seamless as what you have just described it. Um, but there, there are ways to do it. So it sounds like the um, the new connection will have to uh, still hop on this new sort of uh, BPF cubic two or um, first. Like we cannot try to migrate. They say I want I still want to keep it the same um, congestion control name like BPF cubic. Then there is not a way that we can just make the new connection move and eventually all the old connections sort of um, close and uh, smoothly transition to sort of a, like from the surface, it would like it would look like we just uh, transparently upgraded um, the module or the, the congestion control. And... Yeah. Yeah, no, not as seamless as you have in mind and also I would like that in this way like just load the little BPF cube and then all the connections existing connection will will automatically switch to that uh, no it's, it can be done right now okay uh, thanks so I'll have uh, the last question uh, from um, uh, is it possible to register a BPF CC without root access no 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 yeah, I'll probably consider that's a bit uh, uh, risky <laughs> too. Um, okay, so uh, thanks Martin uh, for your great uh, talk. So we will move uh, next to about the TLS improvement by uh, Utaro. Yes, let me share my screen. Uh, anyways, Karen, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. So, and can you shoot, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So now let me start my presentation. Oops. Um, hello, uh, I'm Yutaro Hayakawa. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation in this workshop. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a brief introduction of our research work. It, it's pretty much different from the agenda, but uh, the prison, the proxies without the pain. Uh, during, uh, during working on this work, the, we have came up with the good use cases of some Linux kernel features like TCP repair or the KTLS. So let me, let us introduce those as well. So that would be interesting. So first of all, the main target of this research work is an object stress systems. So the simplified architecture looked like this. Uh, it consists uh, of the front-end proxies and the back-end search pool. The clients request their objects through the HTTP, uh, which keep alive over persistent TCP or DLS connections. And front-end proxies terminates, terminates the client connections and forwards the request to the backend based on the content, uh, like object IDs or any other application level information. Uh, and they are also responsible for rela relaying the responses from the backends and encrypting it uh, in case of the TLS. As a result, the front-end proxies will experience the high CPU utilization. Uh, the primary cause is uh, the cost of just forwarding the large amount of the data and the encryption. Uh, at the same time, the entire cluster will end up to the low network utilization because all of the traffic uh, between the client and the backends will go through the front end proxies. So that, end up, that is the problem. And so what we came up for eliminating this bottleneck uh, is allow backends to directly respond to the client by migrating the TCP or TLS connections instead of relaying everything on the front end. So, the basic mechanism uh, is after the front end node receives the request that it ex extracts the TCP connection state uh, using the TCP repair uh, and send it to the backend uh, together with the TLS state and the HTTP request. Uh, then backend then restore the connection uh, and configure the special programmable switch uh, inside the network 
to change the routing or mango the IP address. Then directory send back the response to the client through the migrated connection. So in this mechanism, the front end is no longer responsible for relaying the response and the encryption will be performed in the back end. Uh, so uh, we no longer have the bottleneck on the front end. Uh, actually, this is the technique known as the TCP handoff uh, and introduced in some academic paper about 20 years ago, uh, but not widely deployed yet. Uh, and, but uh, as of 2020, uh, it is now becoming the realistic uh, thanks to the support of TCP repair in Linux. Uh, and it's now becoming easy to develop the special switching logic like this in speed uh, with the framework like the P4 or the ABPF. Uh, but we have soon uh, we have soon realized that the TCP handoff is too much difficult to implement correctly. Uh, let me explain one simple example that the TCP connection corrupts because of the naive implementation. So here we have a sequence diagram of the idea TCP handoff scenario. So client send a GET request, uh, front end uh, checkpoint the TCP state, send send it over the network. And back and configure the switch and restore the TCP state and send back the response to the client. This is the idea scenario. But for now, think about the case that the client sends something to the front end during the handoff. So the TCP socket on the front end is already in the repair mode, uh, but the back end uh, doesn't restore the connection or the configure the switch yet. So what will happen in here uh, is the reset from the front end. So this behavior is a, just a specification of the TCP repair, but it makes sense because the otherwise the state of the connection will become inconsistent uh, among the back end and the front end after migration. So to overcome this problem, uh, we extend the handoff protocol to lock the TCP connection uh, by extra switch rules. Uh, when the lock is active on the switch, uh, the, it will block all of the packets from the client. So then we can avoid the resetting problem. So this is just one example. Uh, there are many other problems like, like this uh, for implementing the TCP handoff correctly. So one of our contribution in this work is to make the solution against these kind of the, uh, problems. Uh, actually, most of the functionalities of uh, our system didn't require the kind of re kernel modification. Uh, we have developed the features that uh, not notifies the complete uh, socket removal. Uh, through event FT to deal with the time wait state, uh, but this can be implemented uh, with kernel module. Uh, but there is uh, one feature we couldn't achieve with the kernel module, uh, that was the KTLS integration. So it was not a mandatory feature to support, but uh, we were interested in applying KTLS to enhance the performance of our PLC. Uh, to apply KTLS to the TCP handoff, uh, KTLS also has to support checkpoint and restore the TLS states, such as sequence number or shape key. Um, actually, the most of our requirement was already satisfied. Uh, we can get the current PC TLS state uh, from the KTLS socket by get up. Uh, this works as the checkpointing, and we can put the state again to the migrated socket with set sock opt. Uh, this works as a restoring of the TLS state. But currently, the get sock ops for the Rx site is somehow missing. So we have made a small patch uh, that we would like to upstream it. And now we are uh, uh, planning to issue the RSC patch. So we are very happy if someone supports this change. Uh, and if you, have, uh, if you have any particular concern about this feature, uh, please let us know in here. Uh, so, now I'll wrap up this talk. Uh, I introduced a brief overview of our research work, uh, present proxy without pain, without the pain. So our paper we appears appears to the NSDI 21. Uh, we have many other stuff we couldn't introduce in here. Uh, 
in this paper. So like how we can design the programming interface to integrate the TCP handoff to the applications, um, optimization to minimize the handoff latency uh, and performance number with realistic object storage workload and so on. So if you are interested in, uh, please check it out. So that's all from me and I'll take a question. Thanks. Um, I have a quick question that, um, so is the option of simply have all the backend handling the TLS connections, not a viable option? Cause that sounds, we can avoid all this uh, complicated hijacking. Um, mm -hmm. Just have the backend handle those. That's not yes, an option. That, uh, that could be the pra uh, practical, uh, the pra practical method we have in, uh, we have in the, the real environment deployment, but the, the benefit of this approach is we still can um, still can handle the uh, request based on the content uh, for the application level information. So okay. we don't lose the benefit of the proxies, but uh, we can uh, get the performance. I see, okay, thank you. <clears throat> um. Any questions from the audience? Uh, okay, so the, the main thing about this uh, the presentation or the why we ask some presentation slots so here is so the the we have some pretty good use case of TCP repair. So, but we have one missing thing in the kernel as we, you thoroughly explained, which is some get stock opt of TLS state. So, I really want to hear if there is any objection or problem with adding this and the get sock of the option into the main kernel. Um, I think we have a question from the chat that is the architecture who is responsible for security filtration, uh, for example, application layer DDoS, who is responsible for the security filtration? Mm, so, uh, you mean the in the in the typical proxying proxying workload, uh, so the the front end proxy is usually usually responsible for the security implication. So that that is the same same for this uh, uh, this architecture uh, because the front end still see the application level request. Uh, so is that answer to your question? Excuse me, do you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, the question is that um, in application layer uh, DDoS attacks or application attacks like uh, uh, web attacks uh, consider uh, some injections like XSS or SQL injections, you need to access to the body of HTTP requests. So um, you need uh, you need uh, remove uh, TL TLS, decrypted TLS. So usually if you uh, face some uh, application layer DDoS attacks, you need a plain HTTP and process the plain HTTP request. Um, I'm wondering how in your architecture and who will be responsible for all the filtration. Uh, it seems like web application firewalls or application layer DDoS uh, mitigation systems must move from content uh, systems to backend systems. Is it correct? Uh not really, uh, because the uh, as we uh, ex explained in the uh, the beginning, the let's see, uh, this sequence diagram. This is the ID ID state ID scenario for this architecture. So the as you see, the front end still can see the get request upon the clients. So the, that kind of the the security mechanism can be worked in here. Uh, is that? Answer to your question. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, I see. I see now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, in order to um, uh, move on uh, to make sure that we are on time, I do have to uh, cut the mic. Uh, I know Lars just posted a question, but we're a little bit behind. So please uh, take it offline um, over the chat. Thank you. And I think that's a great talk. Uh, we'll move on to our next talk, which is the BBR2 summary. So um, today uh, we wanted to give a little uh, overview and update 
on the uh, work our team at Google has been doing on uh, BBR congestion control at Google. Uh, and of course, this is joint work with uh, my team uh, at Google, including uh, Yu Chun and Sohail on this call uh, and the team that you see here uh, below. Uh, next slide, please. So you may be asking yourself, uh, why are we talking about BBR? Then we talk about this at NetDev a few years ago. Uh, and indeed, we, we talked a bit about BBR um, in the fall of 2016 at NetDev, uh, just after we released the first version of the code uh, upstream. Um, but we've been working on it since then to improve things. And uh, in particular, um, there was an effort that we've been calling uh, BBR v2 that started um, in 2017. And the, the high level goals were, were basically in two parts. Um, one is that uh, in the internet, um, we had a couple things we wanted to improve. Uh, first, we wanted to improve uh, BBR's coexistence with AIMD style protocols like uh, Reno and Cubic. Um, also, we wanted to improve the throughput of BBR for high speed Wi Fi links. Um, and then we also wanted to improve uh, BBR's performance inside data centers, uh, where, where we wanted to beat or at least match uh, DC TCP um, by using uh, initially ECN signals and then uh, also potentially delay signals uh, as congestion signals. Um, and, you know, it's kind of in, um, been an interesting journey with all of this because it, it's definitely pretty challenging to try to be a, uh, a general purpose uh, or all weather congestion control that works both in public internet and uh, within a data center and between data centers over a high speed WAN. Uh, those are, those environments all have their own challenges. Um, so for VBRV1, the, the challenges that we were focusing on were uh, number one, avoiding buffer bloat, that is uh, keeping the queues short, even in these last mile uh, bottlenecks that might have uh, seconds worth of buffer available. Um, another thing we were focused on with version one was um, avoiding overreacting to small amounts of packet loss, uh, which is a kind of uh, classic issue that, that Reno and Cubic have. Um, another issue that we've had to work on a lot over the years is dealing with aggregation effects. So a lot of link layers um, have various aggregation mechanisms where they build up big batches of data packets or acts and then release those all in a big burst. Um, so a lot of uh, link layers have that um, kind of behavior. Uh, it's pr particularly pronounced in Wi-Fi, but you also see it in cellular links, DOCSIS links, and high-speed um, data center uh, NICs. Um, and so it you know, when you add all, all of those together, that's kind of most connections. So it's a real issue to, to, uh, to work with. Um, another thing that we've been working on is, is coexistence with flows um, out there in the uh, in networks where, you know, the thing about congestion control is it, it's, a, it's a difficult problem because it's sort of a, a distributed algorithm where you don't even know what algorithms other people are using when they're sharing the network with you, you know, and, and in the case of congestion control, it might be Reno or Cubic or BBR, uh, you just don't know. So you have to have an algorithm that can handle any of those cases in some reasonable way. Um, data centers are particularly challenging because you get these swarms of, of uh, thousands or even millions of bursty connections inside tiny uh, data center switch buffers. Um, it's always a challenge to balance CPU usage and network friendliness. Uh, there's always this question, do you try to build bursts in order to save CPU, or do you try to build smaller um, clumps of packets so that you can be uh, more friendly to the network buffers? It's always a tricky trade-off. Um, of course, in the public internet, uh, policing is, is widely used and other weird um, throttling and AQM schemes, and you have to have a story for those. Uh, and then, of course, at a high level, there's always this core question of how do you make the trade-off um, when you're looking at the complexity in the code. You know, you would like to have the code be as simple and elegant as possible, but you also need to achieve usable performance. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So uh, one of the improvements we've been um, making as we go from BBRv1 to v 2 is um, a very much improved coexistence with Reno and Cubic. So the issue with BBRv1 was that if you had BBR and uh, Reno or Cubic flows that were sharing a bottleneck, then the Reno or Cubic flows in some cases would get um, considerably lower throughput. 
Um, with the BRV2, we take this approach where we explicitly adapt the time scale on which the flows are probing for bandwidth and, and putting more packets in the network so that the BBR flows can better coexist with the Reno and Cubic flows um, because those Reno and Cubic flows are very sensitive to packet loss and in particular, the amount of time between the packet losses that those flows see. So here you can see some examples. Uh, this is with a, a tool that we actually open sourced um, uh, last summer called Transperf. Uh, where it's running a few cubic flows uh, and a BBR flow sharing with them. And you can see the BBR flow down there at the bottom in the sort of pinkish color is doing a pretty good job of sharing that bandwidth uh, and also keeping the retransmit rate on the bottleneck uh, pretty low. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing that we've focused on uh, over the last couple of years is making sure the BBR achieves uh, good throughput for Wi-Fi links. Um, as I mentioned before, Wi-Fi is one of these link technologies where you see these pretty big aggregation effects. Uh, and with BBRv1, the initial release, we saw that there were some cases where the minimum round trip time for a connection was very low, but the bottleneck was Wi-Fi. Uh, in those cases, you could get low throughput. Uh, and so we did some work on this. And um, with BBRv2, we think we see pretty good results. Uh, the basic approach is to have the flow explicitly estimate the recent degree of aggregation effects that it's seeing and then budget some extra congestion window to, to allow reaching full throughput in those kind of paths with aggregation. And so in our tests, for example, on YouTube, we're seeing EBRV2 matches uh, Cubic for th uh, throughput on uh, users with Wi-Fi links. Um, and in controlled tests, we can see the same uh, uh, kind of results. Uh, and that aggregation modeling code is now um, available in both the quick BBRv2 and in the Linux uh, BBRv2 code, uh, or sorry, in the Linux um, BBRv1 code as of uh, Linux 5.1. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So another thing uh, we've worked on, uh, as I mentioned, was, was allowing BBRv2 to use ECN as a congestion signal. Um, BBRv1 uh, does not use ECN, but with V2 uh, is using um, DC TCP style ECN signals, uh, if those are available, in order to have extra signaling information to help the flows keep queues uh, nice and short. So here are some just example test results showing that, um, you know, if you've got some BBR flows uh, and you're getting um, DC TCP style ECN signals at a particular um, uh, queue threshold that the flows are able to keep the queues uh, nice and short. Um, I should mention that also there's uh, in the public uh, internet, there is some work underway um, with an effort called L4S. Uh, I think it's something like low latency, low loss, scalable throughput, something like that. It's basically an effort to take DC TCP style ECN and use that on the public internet. And so uh, we're also hoping that uh, BBRv2 will be able to go ahead and use L4S style signals when those are standardized and available. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just a quick summary um, to sort of compare um, Cubic, which of course is the default congestion control uh, for Linux and, and also these days even for Windows and Apple uh, OSs uh, to BBRv1 and, and BBRv2. Um, so if we look at the, the model parameters to the state machine, of course, Cubic doesn't really think of itself as a, a model-based congestion control, uh, but BBRv1 uh, uses uh, the bandwidth or throughput and the round trip time, uh, while BBRv2 has a, a richer model that also incorporates, as I was mentioning, the uh, maximum recent amount of aggregation that the flow is seeing, and then also the maximum safe in-flight based on the congestion signals it's seeing like ECN or loss. Um, so when we look at the loss response of these algorithms, um, so Cubic uh, has a, uh, an approach where it will reduce the congestion window by 30% on any round trip uh, where there's uh, packet loss, uh, whereas BBRv1 at sort of longer time scales tries to be loss agnostic to a high level. Um, and by contrast, BBRv2 does have um, an explicit handling of loss, where it tries to target making sure that the loss rate stays below 
uh, 2% on an instantaneous basis. And with an average, it's much lower. Um, so if we look at ETN response, uh, cubic, um, you can use the RFC 3168 sort of classic ECM standardized about 20 years ago. Um, BBRV1 doesn't use that. Uh, BBRV2, as I mentioned, can use um, BCTCP style ECN or Alpharus style uh, ECN once that's standardized. Um, if we look at the sort of startup behavior as flows are starting up, um, Cubic uses slow start until the RTT rises. Um, BBRV1 just looks for a, a throughput plateau. BBRV2 uh, will slow start until either the throughput flat plateaus or either ECN or the loss rate goes above its, its target rate. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give a quick uh, visual um, overview of how these different algorithms behave. So Reno has this classic uh, sawtooth behavior um, that you've probably seen before, where there's a multiplicative decrease by 50% every time there's a round trip time of loss. And then there's this slow linear growth of one packet per round trip time that's added into the network. Um, but that gives you this sort of very non-scalable um, growth where you need a thousand times more time to reach a thousand times higher bandwidth. Uh, and that means in particular, if you think about high speed WANs uh, with long RTTs, uh, you need a long time between any losses in order to ramp back up to full utilization. Um, in fact, at 10 gigabits and 100 millisecond path, you need an hour between packet losses to maintain full utilization which is super difficult. That works out to like two times 10 to the negative 10th as a loss rate, which is just impossible to uh, maintain on a real uh, network. Uh, next slide, please. So Cubic tries to improve uh, this uh, scalability of the C1 growth, and it, it does to some extent. But you, it, because it's a Cubic effect, you still need uh, 10 times more time to reach 1,000 times higher bandwidth. Um, so this curve that you can see here uh, that sort of requires to quickly ramp up to the last point where you saw loss does buy you some improvements, but it still has some scalability issues. And in particular, if we look at this benchmark of a, a 10 gigabit path with 100 millisecond round trip time, you need 40 seconds between any losses that a flow sees, which is a definite improvement over an hour, but it's still a lot of um, time that you need to avoid losses. So the loss rate has to be uh, something like um, three to the uh, uh, times 10 to the negative eighth, which is still uh, infeasible for most uh, networks. Uh, next slide, please. So BBR has um, a slightly different approach. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, overall it aims to, to reduce the time with the Q full uh, versus um, uh, BBRv1 or cubic. And it tries to have a sort of more scalable exponential growth uh, so that it can use uh, newly available bandwidth in logarithmic time instead of uh, cube root. And to consider again our benchmark of a 10 gigabit uh, path with 100 millisecond round trip time, um, the goal here with BBRV2 is to be able to have uh, up to the target amount of loss in every round trip and still be able to fully utilize that path. Um, uh, next slide, please. So where are we with BBRV2? Um, so we're in the middle of deploying it at Google. Um, on google.com Google and YouTube, uh, we're running um, global uh, but small percentage uh, AV experiments uh, comparing Cubic, BBRV1, and BBRV2. Uh, we're seeing reduced queuing delays uh, versus both BBRV1 and Cubic. And we're seeing reduced packet loss uh, versus uh, BBRV1. Um, internally, uh, BBRV2 is, is currently being deployed as the default congestion control for traffic within Google. Uh, and of course, we're continuing to iterate uh, using both uh, this production uh, rollout, uh, production experiments, and, and lab tests. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in conclusion, um, the BBRV2 code is uh, out there and ready for uh, research experiments. Um, you can find the, uh, the Linux TCP BBR v2 code uh, in our team's uh, GitHub repo at uh, github.com slash google slash BBR. And here's the particular link for the readme for the, the v2 release. Uh, it's, BBR v2 is also available for QUIC um, if you're someone who works in the QUIC transport protocol. Um, and 
um, overall, we invite researchers to go ahead and um, check it out, um, take it for a spin, see what you see. Um, you know, and there's a, a, a mailing list for the BBR uh, dev effort. Uh, and feel free to share your uh, ideas about test cases that you think are important or metrics that should be evaluated, any test results you see, um, any ideas or uh, patches you have for algorithms. Um, and we're always happy to see patches or, or look at uh, packet traces. Um, and I think that's it. And I think we might have just one minute for Q&A before the next uh, talk, which will give uh, some more experience with uh, BBR v2. Um, so we got a question on chat. Uh, on a network without ECN, will BBR v2 increase throughput until it hits the 2% loss rate target? And why is that 2%? Why not 0.5%? Right. Um, so BBR v2, um, when there's no ECN, it will, um, it will either find its operating point based on its estimate of the bandwidth delay product. Um, so if it's not seeing loss, then it will basically look at the bandwidth it's achieving uh, and, and the, uh, the minimum round trip time of the path and estimate what's a, a reasonable amount of data to keep in the network that will allow it to achieve full throughput without building too much queue. So if it's not seeing loss, it will use that approach, which was sort of the core of BBR v1. Um, if it does see loss, then it will be um, you know, ensuring that as it's probing for bandwidth, it uh, makes sure that once it sees uh, an instantaneous loss rate in a particular round trip that's at 2% or higher, it goes ahead and it stops probing. Um, and the because these flows are only probing some of the time, the average loss rate tends to be much lower than that sort of instantaneous 2% number. Um, and that target um, was chosen um, based on a sort of a, a series of trade-offs um, and we are still evaluating um, you know, what exact value there makes sense. And it's a sort of set of trade-offs about you know, how well does the algorithm coexist with Reno and Cubic? How um, good does it do uh, at fully utilizing paths that might have um, shallow buffers and really high speed, long RTT um, paths with big BDPs um, and, and that sort of thing. So we welcome um, experiments or um, uh, results from people's production deployments to help inform the sort of research discussion about exactly how, what uh, threshold that um, we should be using for that. Okay, and the next question is, any idea when BBRB2 will be upstreamed? That's a good question. It's a, <laughs> it's tough to guess exactly when. the we The main thing is that we want to be sure that um, it's work, BBRv2 is working well for all of the important workloads at Google, so that we have confidence that it's a good, solid, general purpose congestion control algorithm. Um, and in the meantime, of course, people can always uh, download the code from GitHub and go ahead and uh, take it for a spin. Um, that's I think that's uh, that's what we can offer right now. <laughs> okay, so next talk is for the Alexis um, evaluating BBR two on another different network. Hi, uh, my name is Alexi, I, and today I'm going to talk about uh, evaluating BBR v two on Badge. So I'm an infrastructure engineer. Um, I work at Dropbox. Previously, I worked at LinkedIn and Yandex. I was working on databases, storage systems, and right now on traffic slash networking. So um, we talk a lot in our tech blog about uh, all the uh, optimizations that we do to our traffic stack from like lower levels uh, on operating system driver side to a higher level of uh, intelligent DNS routing and library optimization. Uh, but uh, our team is very small and uh, we don't have a dedicated uh, kernel engineer. So we don't even have a kernel team currently. Uh, but we really like to experiment with different types of things. And uh, this talk will be uh, about one of these experiments. So it's all started with BBRv1 uh, when we tried out hot new congestion control thing back in 2007. Um, so 
our first experiment with BBR uh, V1 showed great results. We saw uh, so the users that we thought were actually bottlenecked by their um, internet connection actually happened to be uh, bottlenecked on the um, our congestion control. And when, when we rolled out um, BBR V1, we sh we we seen great results from it. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, food for thought. And eventually we rolled out BBR V1 to our whole edge network. Over time though, we saw some downsides of BBR V1. Um, mainly, uh, probably all of you know that it's uh, not very fair to the rest of congestion control al algorithms. It has an insane packet loss of up to 6% or so on our boxes. Um, like all the, all the downsides started to be more and more apparent. Uh, still a good benefit in uh, performance though. So BBR developers also notice that. So th the, that is a list of issues with BBR we want straight from the developers. Uh, so they've identified um, uh, unfairness of BBR we want. They've identified uh, its aggressiveness. Um, also some issues in aggregated parts when uh, there is ag, uh, ag aggregations and of course uh, no support for ECN. So um, they started to address that. Before we jump into the experimental results, couple of caveats about uh, all of you who own production systems, just uh, all of you probably know, but just want to repeat it. Uh, please upgrade your kernels if you uh, support any, uh, operate any production uh, network, like new kernel usually gives a lot of uh, performance. So the best thing for performance uh, is usually upgrading your kernel. Of course, there are occasional regressions. There are new vulnerabilities that are getting mitigated with new kernels and occasional slowdowns. So from networking perspective, um, each new kernel is generally faster than the previous one. Here is an example how uh, just for upgrading from our main production kernel 4.15 uh, to 5.3 test kernel that we used for BBR V2 test, we got around 15% performance decrease, 15-20% performance decrease just for free. Uh, that, that most likely related to improvements to BBR V1 and uh, like uh, they've added uh, optimizations for Wi-Fi and aggregation, but uh, regardless, each new kernel in each one of our tests usually performs better. Uh, second, upgrading your user space. So if you operate, again, any production, uh, any large scale networks, having um, new user space helps a lot with troubleshooting. For example, uh, here is a IP, uh, IP route that comes with Ubuntu 16. Uh, and that is a relatively new IP route. Just notice that like all the new fields that we have, um, it's essential for troubleshooting, uh, especially any performance issue. So in the new IP route, for example, we see all the internal BBR data, uh, like pacing gain and estimated R uh, mean RTT, uh, to worry, very, very useful things, like how much time you spend being receive window limited, send window limited, uh, like that is uh, generally a very useful tools for you to be able to troubleshoot any issues with uh, this performance. And third one, uh, fair queuing scheduler, please use fair queuing scheduler if you can. Um, it's not for fair queuing itself, it's mostly for uh, pacing. Pacing is very important in the modern network, especially high speed. Um, and where is there a lot of asymmetry between your speeds and your client speeds. Uh, we, e and even within the backbone. So um, there is great talk from uh, Van Jacobson about beyond as fast as possible and then sending data as fast as possible is not actually the, uh, in theory, is not actually the best thing you can do. But in practice, it also like, there, there is an anecdote, for example, from our production network when we uh, saw a lot, of, like packet drops were a large problem in our networks and uh, our network engineer actually wanted to replace some of the shallow buffer switches with the more um, advanced ones uh, with uh, larger buffer spaces, but just by rolling out FQ, we get rid of all these drops, even on the backbone when there is not uh, as much uh, speed asymmetry. Anyway, um, 
use FQ, FQ uh, can actually improve your packet loss quite a bit. Uh, and before we jump into experimental results of BBRV2, a uh, couple of disclaimers and the test setup. So first of all, it's uh, not a low latency experiment. All our flows that we were examining were around, uh, were filtered by one megabyte of transfer data. So this is high throughput bulk, bulk flows. Uh, second, data is heavily aggregated. There are no like single TCP dump slash TCP trace drill dumps. Uh, we have millions and millions of connections. Um, so uh, data is heavily aggregated. And of course, that is a real production test. So all the imperfections of traffic, uh, be it like duplicated packets, re heavy reordering pass with high packet loss, everything will be present in that, uh, in that data set. It's a real production traffic. Uh, even more specifically, we used one single pop in Tokyo, four boxes in it, uh, three, one boxes with all the kernel, all BBRV1, and three boxes with the new kernel uh, with Qubit, BBRV1, and BBRV2. Again, only bulk flows, uh, and we were looking at sampled SS data and sampled uh, Nginx log. Um, Yep, that's pretty much all of it. Uh, we'll be covering only new kernels uh, from now on. Uh, comparison between uh, all the new kernel BBRV1 code I've showed previously. So now we will be only looking at 5.3. Um, yeah, so, sorry, uh, the kernel is a bit old at that point. The presentation was for the first um, first version of um, NetConf conference. Okay, so. And again, before we jump into the uh, practical results, a bit of theory. So that slide is straight from Neil's presentation from um, IETF. Um, it shows BBR design principles with all the new stuff from BBR v2 in bold. You can see that uh, there is a lot of stuff, but the general idea is uh, twofold. First, make it fair. Uh, make it more fair, uh, fairer to other congestion control protocols uh, and uh, put some notion of packet loss into the model. So uh, do uh, react quickly to change in condition. So the, these are two things and we'll see, um, we'll see how it actually affects um, experimental results. Here, here is a comparison from um, between BBRV1 and BBRV2 in a more table format. So we can see that there are no new additions to the uh, network model itself. There is also finally the explicit loss targets and early exit from startup if these uh, loss targets are either explicit or implicit are broken. Okay, and ECN, we did not test ECN in our test, but uh, it seems like it's BBRV2 can be a drop-in replacement for uh, DCTCP, but who knows. Okay, now uh, we jump into all the graphs. So first we're gonna go over properties that we see on the link, and then we will jump into what it, how does it actually affect the throughput, uh, throughput that we see on the link. So first thing that we do, even without like, uh, First thing that we noticed, even without actually looking at the uh, per connection stats, is that when we deploy BBR2 uh, code, we see way lower packet loss. So immediately packet loss drops a lot. Uh, it's still higher than cubic, uh, but I would assume that that is expected. Uh, if you look deeper into our uh, retransmission percentage we uh, on per connection level. So we see that it generally BBRV2 looks way better on PDF uh, graphs. The only caveat is uh, there are some connections that, are, that have higher packet loss at 60%, sometimes 80% or even 90. So there is something is definitely wrong there. Beside that uh, small percentage of um, connections with really bad packet loss, everything else looks uh, looks really good. I would su suspect it's some kind of bug there, but I'm not sure. Uh, if we compare to Cubic, um, BBRV2 has still higher connect uh, packet loss than um, 
big on per connection basis. Uh, still, I would assume that is expected given uh, its tolerance uh, to some packet loss. So it, since it has that packet loss uh, target, I would assume it is fine for it to have higher packet loss, except for that 60% case and above. Uh, if we look at the uh, heat map of that, we can see that uh, VBR, um, V1 V on the top, V2 on the bottom, it's more, V2 is more squashed along all RTTs, so it's not, uh, it's very fairly distributed. So there is no uh, correlation between like packet loss and, um, and the RTT. Then we can look into in-flight packets and we see that BBR V1 has way less packets in flight. Uh, that is actually uh, one of the properties of uh, BBR V2 model. So they have uh, max, uh, max in flight now. And that in theory, that should be like that. And in pra practice actually proves that. Uh, what's even more interesting that VBR V2 has less packets in flight than Cubic, which makes it better, which is quite uh, quite interesting. So less buffer bloat from um, VBR V2. Uh, if we plot uh, RTT versus in flight, in VBR V2 we can see that general upward trend with more like data on the wire depending on RTT. Uh, and uh, in v, uh, V2, we can actually see it more down to earth. Uh, there is one line, a uh, strange line that um, dependency between uh, RTT and um, in-flight segments, which, uh, which looks weird. Besides that, it's all squished, normally distributed. And if we compare it to uh, cubic, even we, we can see that it's still better. It's more, uh, more down to earth. So uh, even compared to cubic in flight, looks way better. On RTT wise, we did not look in RTT too much because these are bulk flows. But since we still collected that data, uh, we know that uh, BBR v2 RTTs are better than BBR v1 uh, based on PDFs, and uh, but still worse than uh, cubic for some reason. That may be uh, some bug in our code because we see lower in flight, but for some reason RTTs are. Uh, are higher from our uh, from our perspective. Oh, one one more interesting graph is about uh, receive window limiter. That that new stat from new uh, IP route uh, version SS version. We see that uh, BBR v2 is way uh, way less um, less often window uh, limited. Receive window limited, well, which is also great. That means we burst uh, less on the wire. And uh, leave some headroom, which which is good. It's even uh, less uh, receive window limited than uh, cubic, which is again uh, quite quite good. We burst less, uh, we buffer bloat less. So all of these theoretical properties lead to some interesting practical results in terms of bandwidth. So what we saw is all different facets of the of the traffic, and now we can actually see what what the bandwidth looks like. And bandwidth wise, uh, BBR v2 is slower, uh, and we can see that like the it is it is slower in the the. We can see that it is slower in that um, high, uh, like low low performance range. With on low speeds, it is uh, slower than BBR v2. So, uh, and on higher connection speeds, it is actually quite close to BBR v2. Uh, we have hard cut off here at around uh, one, uh, I think one one thirty five or or so. But uh, the further down the line, data gets more noisy, but we're, uh, very in line. So the, on higher speeds, BBR v2 actually very comparable to BBR v1. On lower speeds, uh, speeds where congestion is more uh, likely, uh, we, we see that BBR v2 is slower. Um, okay, and uh, compared to cubic, compared to cubic, BBR v2 is faster. And you can see that on the further side of the graph, the, the faster connection of user becomes uh, 
the more is the difference. So the more, uh, the faster is user's connection, the more benefit you get from BBRV2 without like increasing congestion uh, that much. So uh, as you can see, it just gets further and further apart uh, as the uh, connection speed grows. And if you look at good food from Nginx point of view, so the, these are based on Nginx blog, we can see that on lower speeds, uh, BBRV2 is way closer to uh, cubic but on higher uh, connection speeds, it's actually closer to uh, BBRV2 performance. So uh, you can see here that balance that uh, it became more cubic friendly uh, and uh, at the same time, it's way faster for users who can actually uh, use that speed. So um, as far for conclusions, uh, the, that is initial slide with all the issues highlighted uh, for BBRV1. Uh, we can actually prove that most of them were fixed, uh, except for ECN that we did not test. Everything else uh, from throughput perspective, it does look way uh, fairer um, and uh, packet loss is reduced and the uh, throughput variation is reduced. So um, all of that, our experimental results show that bandwidth is comparable to cubic on for users that have lower internet speeds and way better um, and comparable to BBRV1 uh, for users with higher internet speeds. Lower packet loss than the BBRV1, still a bit higher than cubic. Uh, data in flight is comparable, uh, uh, sorry, slightly lower than cubic and way lower than BBRV1. Uh, yeah, R better RTT fairness and uh, slightly lower RTT than BBR1. Overall, across all of that, I can say that from our test results, it seems like BBRV2 is drop-in replacement for BBRV1, which is better in all, um, all the cases. The only weird thing that we saw is that uh, that small amount of connections with more than 60% um, uh, packet loss. Except that it's literally drop-in replacement that is better in all the respects. Uh, it may actually be even considered a, a relatively good drop-in replacement for Cubic, especially if you have uh, high performance clients, they will benefit from BBRV1 compared to Cubic. Um, and uh, depending on how we see and test go, uh, goes in our data center, if we ever get to do that, uh, maybe we can prove that uh, BBRV1 can be a drop-in replacement for DCTCP, but that's that's way further out. So recently I was troubleshooting uh, TCP performance in Windows. And very small note uh, for all of you software engineers out here, like Windows net shell trace is way ahead of what we have in, uh, in Linux world. So net shell trace, uh, net sh trace for those who don't know, it's actually, uh, it collects data like TCP dump, um, but also puts in all data from all the various subsystems in the kernel. So you not only have packet trace, you also have all the events that happening inside the kernel. You have um, I, I think async subsystem events like uh, IOCP events, for example. You have socket events like writes and reads. You have uh, data from uh, what you usually get from TCP info or netlink about congestion windows um, and properties of, of the TCP connection. You, you get reordering, you get uh, some memory subsystem events like buffers, et cetera, et cetera. Like uh, all the things in one place, you run net shell trace, you get all the things that you need for troubleshooting. While in Linux world, uh, when you collect just plain TCP dump, it is the same TCP dump that was uh, 20 years ago. Uh, what you get is uh, data on the wire where you need to infer what actually happened into, in the kernel. And uh, like based on SACs, based on uh, some, other, uh, some other weird things like window advertisement changes, like there is, there is not enough uh, debug da data in there. Uh, if we see in BBRV2 code, they added a lot of debugging code uh, just for ease of troubleshooting. Um, nowadays with eBPF, we can actually get 
a, a, a utility we can create as a community and a utility that can pipe all the relevant data from all the subsystems in the kernel um, inside the trace, um, as for example, comments in TCP dump. Uh, that would be quite useful for any performance uh, related uh, either research like we did or uh, any performance related troubleshooting. So please, for those of you who, ne who never tried like uh, touching Windows, please look into Nutshell Trace and uh, Message Analyzer. They are great. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much all of it. Uh, now Q&A. Okay, thanks for a great talk. Uh, okay, so I guess we have someone ready to ask the question. Go ahead. Um, then I'll read out this question on the chat. Um, re on the higher RTP than Qubit, can you please elaborate what do you mean by bug in our code? Is that the stats gathering code in this yeah. test? Oh, okay. Um, oh, yeah, it, it is likely the bug in our code. Um, I was recently reviewing it. Um, uh, SS basically provides two sets of information for BBR. It has MRTT from BBR and MRTT from the uh, a generic mean RTT. So I think uh, we misplaced these two and for cubic because it doesn't provide um, MRTT from BBR cells because it's cubic. Um, uh, we actually compare two different sets of data that may uh, that may uh, actually result in that kind of inconsistency. So I would actually uh, scratch that part from the presentation about comparing a uh, specific uh, BBR to BB, uh, BBR one to BBR v two comparison is right. BBR uh, versus cubic may be a bug in our code just because we use two different sets of data and I haven't looked at how they are implemented in kernel. How does uh, BBR estimate uh, MRTT in its code and how- uh, The last remaining question on your talk was that when mm -hmm. you were running the experiment, let's say for BBR v2, uh, was the other traffic still using cubic? So maybe you are not, you are seeing an effect of like the BBR v2 versus BBR, uh, and cubic competition. I think that was the intention of the question. Okay, so in our tests, uh, bottleneck is uh, way outside of our network. Bottleneck usually is uh, network equipment or the polisher slash shaper on the client side um, or closer to client. So there, there, is in, there will be some competition uh, depending on users' um, usage between BBRv1, BBRv2, and um, Cubic and on these links. Uh, that, that's true. We just uh, don't know what, what is the proportion. Depending on what uh, sites user uses, um, there will be some competition. So of course, us change and congestion control. Um, changes the mix of that competition. Just like if Google changes uh, congestion control on YouTube, that changes the mix of that competition on the bottleneck, um, which is way closer to the client. On our networks, we don't, uh, since we are not using BBRv2 internally inside our networks, we, uh, we cannot say what, what is happening when uh, these uh, TCP congestion control actually compete directly on our network in known proportions, please. Okay, great. And then um, I just remembered another question uh, before uh, the outage. Um, the I think the the data that on the receive limited um, that we are seeing BBRv2 uh, has lower receive limited uh, cases, probably because it has lower in flight in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, t -t 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 that that is true. That uh, that that uh, that theory correlates uh, very well with um, uh, with the data. Though at the same time, like just having lower receive window limit does not uh, mean much by itself. Like if you are zero percent receive uh, window limited, you are probably doing something wrong. So um, just by uh, just by saying that it is lower um, 
doesn't say much. In the meantime, if it's the full graph is kind of lower, then it is probably a, a good thing. Um, yeah, it, it means less buffer bloat. Uh, uh, yep. Okay, great. Um, I think uh, last question, um, clarify, clarifying question. When you say cubic, is this cubic plus P5 or fast or cubic plus FQ? Oh yeah, uh, that that's a very good one. Yes, uh, everywhere we use uh, cubic plus FQ. So FQ with spacing. Uh, so that is a very, um, uh, I would say, even specifically it's cubic with FQ with spacing without the, I think, high start packet train um, heuristic. I think that's that's a full technical definition of it. Okay, sounds good. It's glad to see that uh, FQ is used uh, in um, any kind any congestion control. I think it's definitely oh, helped. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one small note. The 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 thing that I've mentioned about switches running out of um, of buffer space and producing drops even on our like uh, edge network, like top of the rack switches for edge racks. Uh, the problem I've described when we rolled out FQ and these packet drop uh, drops disappeared. Um, on basically the first hop of our network, uh, it happened even with Qubit. So it wasn't BBRv1 or BBRv2 test even, it was preparation for initial BBRv1 rollout when we first rolled out um, pacing everywhere. And then we started rolling out uh, the BBRv1 itself. So even with uh, Qubit, uh, FQ is very, very useful. Um, it does, uh, or pacing in FQ is very, very useful. Okay, I agree, sounds good. Um, all right, so I think for that, uh, thank you for your talk and sorry about the outage. Uh, we'll move to our open mic uh, discussions. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here we uh, chairs propose like uh, two topics uh, that we can uh, potentially discuss and happy for anyone to, if you have a, a topic you would like to cover, uh, please uh, chime in, uh, um, chime in right now, and and then uh, you can post this on the group chat uh, as well. Um, so um, one topic that we have been sort of uh, looking into uh, is that the cloud VM networking uh, performance issues. Uh, I think the first one is maybe also related to Alex's uh, comments on uh, Linux TCP uh, debugging, that it has very low uh, visibilities uh, for a cloud operator uh, hosting a lot of these VM uh, services. And when they have networking, when the customers have networking issues, right, generally they don't have much visibility, even if they want to debug uh, on their own. Um, just by running on the VMs. Um, and the tools that we have are not very uh, mature uh, there. And then now when you add another layer of hypervisor, you just make things even harder um, uh, to diagnose. Um, another thing that we have uh, a look at is uh, called the NAPI TX uh, back pressure. Uh, this has been uh, fixed uh, upstream. Um, the problem is, that in the older version of uh, uh, Linux kernel, which a lot of cloud users still use, that uh, when they send the packet into the uh, virtual NIC, and uh, the packet will be marked as, you know, um, being released by the NIC, right? So from TCP point of, of view, the packet has been delivered into the network. And when you run, uh, basically a, a loss-based, purely loss-based congestion control, what it can cause is that the TCP uh, would get into this sort of uh, wrong uh, impression that, oh, the packet is being released by the NIC so quickly that I should shuffle more. And potentially it could build a big buffer bloat inside the hypervisor until the hypervisor says, you know, <laughs> no more packet. <laughs> I can uh, chew up and then there will be a massive packet loss um, 
and then that would then percolate into the customers and they will see these massive losses, which again, back to the issue one, they will struggle to figure out what's going on. So this has been sort of fixed by uh, some recent changes so that the NIC will not just orphan the SKB uh, right away. And, but the issue is that some of these upstream changes, right, um, they are slowly being deployed by, uh, or adopted by the customers. So they continue to see uh, this case. Um, some of those are kind of like obvious, uh, which is, uh, for example, um, our upstream Linux stack still use the 200 millisecond min RTO. Um, or like they have a very conservative, say, receiver memory uh, configuration. So that in general, uh, if you two VMs are talking just inside one cloud zone, this RTO is just too uh, conservative. And I think um, work like uh, Martin's, um, which allows us to sort of uh, negotiate a lower RTO if we trusted that you know, or sort of we kind of foreknown the uh, RTT is much shorter will greatly help uh, in this case. But again, some of these default settings are just not quite adequate. And when the cloud users, when they use Linux, um, they don't really know or what to uh, sort of optimize this kind of settings. They just run it as the, you know, the default. Right. And then they struggle to debug like, okay, why can I reach more than 100 megabits per second on your fast backbone network? Well, because your receive memory is uh, says too low. Uh, so that becomes your bottleneck and which if you use the SS tool, you will see that you are always are win limited. But again, this kind of tools are generally not aware by uh, people. Um, sometimes even the, uh, the cloud um, uh, engineers. <laughs> so, and then the lastly, we have seen is that uh, things like ECN, which has proven to be very useful in the data center environment, um, may not be available to these cloud users uh, when they run the VMs, because it's all going through uh, some kind of encapsulation. And you kind of have to um, make sure that the in-cap headers, ECN marks, will get sort of copy or mirrored into the internal packets, um, this kind of thing. Oh, also the flow label changes, right? Like uh, I think um, uh, Larry um, and some Facebook developer uh, check in some really nice features so that when TCP timeout, it will change the flow labels, but <laughs> this is all happening at the internal header. So you need to uh, sort of uh, put that into the external header um, in order for this to take effect. So these are just some of the general problems uh, we have been seeing. Some of this just require very uh, simple tunings. Uh, some of them probably need uh, like a bigger change. For example, how can we make um, cloud VMs visibility uh, a lot better and then available for a cloud operator uh, to monitor? Um, so that's one topic uh, we can happy to brainstorm. Um, another one we have been seeing uh, and by my count, um, every three months, um, there are, um, there is always, every, every, about every quarter I'll be asked that, hey, can TCP deal with extreme reordering? And usually my question is, so what are you trying to do? Is that we would like to spray the packet over this um, 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 data center fabric or you know, over even the internet. Uh, we would like to reroute them as much as possible in order to, for whatever routing reasons or to build a high-speed network. Um, and their concern is always that, uh, I heard TCP doesn't deal with reordering very well. Um, and they are right. Um, the GRO becomes uh, the bottleneck um, um, because of the aggregation won't take a good effect uh, when you, uh, getting packets out of order. And then uh, there are also tricks like, okay, the three do back may not work well. Um, so I'm seeing like a lot of uh, nice um, uh, comments. Um, Eric mentioned that uh, flow variable uh, are not available for cloud users that you use before. 
that's true. I'm saying that even if you using uh, V6, um, it still takes some time to uh, get all these in cap uh, changes um, on the um, on the the hypervisor. Um, uh, people feel free to chime in. I feel I'm the only one talking. Uh, Tom made another comment. Uh, I don't understand that flow label problem. Wouldn't we just set the outer header label based on the inner header? Yes, it's not a problem per se. Um, meaning that these are all can be done by changing the switches, by changing the hypervisors. I'm just saying that when people run Linux VMs, they would expect that, okay, I heard Linux TCP has this and that capabilities. They may not realize that it may not be used or enabled um, in the cloud environment uh, compared to just running it um, in without the, the cloud layer. So while well, we cloud trying to make it sort of transparent, right? You can run the VM just like you're running it as a native host. There are a tricky part like this, which are not visible to the, uh, the users easily. Uh, um, I can kind of make yeah. a couple comments on that. So I think what you said is true. We, we definitely want the, um, the under, uh, overlay network to be transparent. But what I'm missing here is, is why we don't already have this. So a user sends a packet in a VM that goes into the hypervisor or device. And if we're encapsulating that in an IPv6 or in a UDP encapsulation, I don't see much difficulty in setting either the flow label or the UDP source port um, by hashing the packet that, that the user is sending. I mean, that's my assumption is that how it would, would typically work. We definitely do that in the stack. I think in the VM case, it's just a matter of the, the device or the entity that's encapsulating would, would take that same process. So, I mean, it's just a matter of computing a hash really on whatever the, the user's packet is. So I'm still kind of missing what the issue is. Um, I think the issue, uh, the issue I was highlighting was that this is uh, generally invisible to the users uh, when they um, trying to use this feature or assume that uh, things like flow label will be used or like ECN. For example, there will be like users who would, would use DCTCP and um, uh, congestion control, they will set the congestion control to use DCTCP and they, they would expect, okay, I'm enjoying the DCTCP performance. But uh, if the in-cap does not support them, obviously you are just running the plan O Reno. Um, so it's really like the, the visibility issue. There is not like, technically this is not feasible uh, issue. Right? So I hope, is that clear? Well, well, no, I'm still kind of missing it because even when we encapsulate, say, an IP packet, isn't mm -hmm. there a process to copy the ECN bits, disks or bits um, into the, in, in the flow label, into the outer header in some fashion? So it, it uh, seems like so we don't want users to have visibility to the overlay. I agree with that. But if the user set, uh, set QoS or ECN in, in, their, in their IP header, why aren't we just um, moving that information to the outer IP header? I guess that's my basic question. Yeah, so I, I'll give a counter example. And then a user will uh, very happily set all their uh, DSCP to AF4 to enjoy the highest class if they know that, oh, the, um, the cloud operator will just happily copy the DSCP bits. Um, right. Uh, same thing with ECN, same thing with flow uh, uh, label. That means, hey, uh, I can express my intent to reroute. I can express my intent to be treated as the premium class uh, packets uh, very easily. And then there is this uh, another policy uh, gatekeeper to say, are you allowed to do that? But typically this is not transparent to the users. Okay, so I think I think this is a problem, a, a little more general problem. When you, when you start talking about trying to use disk serve, um, where we we may or may not trust the 
the entity and we may we may or may not transform that into an encapsulation that's really a policy thing and I, I think there's some related work on this uh, but but generally it, it seems like whoever's doing this encapsulation they have they have the visibility necessary right so they know what the user's intent is from the packet they're sending they should be able to map that into what what the uh, encapsulation actually does um, I'm a little surprised that you seem to think that, that there's not a lot of, um, I guess, vendors or whomever uh, that's that's doing this properly. Yeah, I agree. Uh, sorry, I was if I was like confusing that making this sounds like uh, it's technically very difficult. It, it's not. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, another uh, question, uh, I think Alexi uh, uh, mentioned that uh, lack of GRO already a bottleneck with uh, ECN. Yeah, I'm actually not sure like with high degree of ECN marking, whether we can, again, I'm not a kernel engineer. I just have a conjecture that maybe uh, with high degree of ECN market, we cannot either GRO or uh, GSO slash T TSO packets. Again, I have a uh, relatively uh, low understanding of that kernel code or network device. Yeah, um, so that's a good question. Uh, so the, the quick answer is uh, it highly depends on how the packets are marked. Um, so in the case of uh, uh, DC TCP, um, typically, the way the switch is configured to say uh, once the queue is above a particular threshold, then uh, it will start marking. So you can imagine that you know when TCP is bursting, they traverse through that queue, typically the same queue. Um, then you will get a continuous marking as the queue keeps building up, right? And so uh, the receiver will receive this uh, sort of a burst of packets that with this continuous ECM mark that will allow them to actually collapse, um, um, coalesce the, the packets into a big jumbo one. So it's not a big uh, problem in uh, the data center environment. But for example, if your switch actually does some kind of like different marking, for example, I want to mark one out of every four packets under certain condition, then it becomes an issue. Um, so I think for data inside the data center, uh, that's not a big issue. Uh, for the 3168, um, since we have not really tested that, uh, then I am not uh, too sure. Um, there has been a recent development on ECN called the accurate ECN and IETF. Um, uh, there, uh, they want to do more precise ECN marking instead of just one bit. They want to uh, signal that, hey, what's the sequence range that gets uh, marked? So in those cases, um, because they may use uh, TCP options to convey uh, this information, sequence being marked, it may potentially uh, break uh, the segmentation of flow. And that has always been my concern of that particular approach. Yeah. Okay. Uh, quick note about the cloud network in the first subject. Um, the, do I understand correctly? If people are using a SER IOV, some of these problems go away. I'm not talking about the setup of the system, but if they just give a PC, like a virtual function uh, from PCI, PCI Express device and give it to the VM, like none of these, um, uh, at least like some of these problems go away, performance problems. Mm, can you maybe give a particular example of the performance issue that would be resolved by the Sir ILV? Uh, like the nappy um, uh, back pressure or stuff like that, because they, they, they get a like physical device or as, as physical as it can get um, uh, almost. Uh, the, they don't won't need to upgrade their kernel to get all these back pressure patches. Uh, they they just give a PCI Express device to VM and it uh, kind of deals with that. So it will see almost a real device on the. Okay, that's very. Yeah. Yeah. 
um yeah uh, i didn't know about that but that's uh, interesting to know yeah uh, the second note about transport design. So recently, uh, the high reordering. So uh, what I recently learned is that, uh, again, during that uh, Windows debugging, um, that uh, Linux actually has rack and heuristic for uh, reordering. Not very high reordering, but uh, Lin uh, Linux can tolerate some amount of reordering on the link. Uh, Windows actually cannot. It treats most of the reordering, um, even with, it implements rack, but it cannot deal with uh, reordering. And the one additional bit of information here is that there are NICs that are too smart. For example, Intel NICs can do flow director with ATR, like um, ATR function when it tries to direct packets to the CPU that owns that flow in the user space right now to, like, de uh, to decrease the amount of uh, cache misses, et cetera. So that thing, uh, that smart me can actually reorder packets by doing, um, at, at least from transport perspective, it, uh, transport will think that it receives uh, packets out of order, even though they are perfectly in order on the link itself. Excuse me. Uh, so that combination of uh, like, there can be basically a reordering on the networks even without any very high uh, complexity just because of very smart NIC that tries to um, direct packets uh, not based on hash but based on the flow uh, flow of the um, packet. Um, Sorry, yes, um, I, yeah, not on the flow but based on some heuristic on like what uh, what process runs on which uh, which die of the processor right now. Sorry. Um, yes, I agree. I think the uh, the kind of uh, parallel processing in general, um, uh, packets being processed by different uh, processor or different route paths is a source of a more and more frequent uh, reordering we are seeing. And, you know, people are actually getting even more aggressive in, I want to make it even more uh, uh, higher, large scale, more uh, multiple uh, paths. And that's why we keep seeing this. So uh, I think it will maybe come soon that we will need to rethink how GRO is being uh, implemented and to deal with that uh, well. Um, and I think time to say pack reordering is a fact of life. Um, I agree. Yeah, I'm not complaining. Uh, and so, you know, we need to adapt. <laughs> Uh, or the transport needs to adapt uh, to that. Um, but I don't think we want to encourage sort of this careless reorderings, right? Uh, but working in harmony with the network and the transport, I think is important. Yeah. Um, I think we are two minutes uh, over time. So um, I just want to um, conclude that um, uh, this workshop and thanks for all these uh, speakers and as well as uh, all the audience uh, asking so many great questions. And um, glad to really see all this advancement in, in the transport uh, layer in uh, NetDev. And with that, um, thanks everyone. And I will see you in the next NetDev. Thanks guys. <laughs>